What makes a game so fundamentally broken it will go down in history as the most bugged and patched set ever? What happens when you take an idea to its absolute limit? Why was set 7 just so broken? Well, to address this, first we need to talk about how we got here. There are a few certainties in life, death, taxes, G2 vs Fnatic finals, and that TFT players love big and small units. Set 7 was the set of giant units, and when you design a set with the idea of big impactful units, the logical conclusion is, of course, to use dragons. They are universally enjoyed, and you can dip into any culture around the world for inspiration. Fire, Shivana, traditional Asian dragon with lightning, El Shin, even a hobbit inspired dragon that hoards gold. Dragons were an amazing concept. They took up two spaces on your team, gave a higher trait bonus, and had inflated stats to compensate for their 8 or 10 gold price, meaning that if you saw one in your shop, you almost always wanted to click on them. Pretty much it was all there. You even had a how to train your dragon in my channel's namesake, Nomzi. Set 7 really marked a huge turning point for Riot, not in terms of game design or mechanics, but in terms of monetization giving us the first chibi with a finisher effect. Now, whether you like this concept or not, let me know down in the comments, and while you're there, consider liking and subscribing. I'm doing all the sets eventually, and the next one probably gonna be a 0.5 set. Let me know which one you want to see. Even though it might be a set that I thoroughly enjoyed, and <laughs> the set I succeeded the most on, I understand there were some problems. Set 7 was a pretty ambitious set, all things considered. It was the second set in what I refer to as the post augment era, so a large chunk of the gameplay we know and love today was present, but there was a whole lot more that Riot tried to add on top, so of course there would be balancing issues, especially when you change a fundamental part of the game, the main point being that big expensive units skew the power dynamic, where typical TFT and other author battlers had balanced around 5 gold and below units, when a huge amount are added to the roster are suddenly worth 8 or more gold, it becomes quite challenging to figure out where they should be in terms of power. How do you scale them? Are as a 1 star are they twice as strong as a 4 cost? The same strength as a 2 star 4 cost? How about a 2 star 3 cost? What about a 2 star? That's 24 gold. Does that mean they're the same strength as a 3 star 3 cost? Do you see what I mean? After having 3 years of normal TFT with normal units, the dragons came in and screwed it all up, changing the flow of the game at its core. In TFT, normally, there are hidden costs that you need to think about. With reroll, you trade the gold that you'd normally use to level to 8 to roll for a 3 star unit and hope you hit early enough that you can have enough time to rebuild and close the gap. With fast 8, you typically use a huge chunk of gold to get to level 8 to make finding 4 cost even easier. But that changes a lot with 8 and 10 cost units, because now leveling to 8 means you need even more money to buy all of these big units, and with less than perfect economy management, you'll end up level 8 at 4-2 with barely enough gold to even 1 star 1, let alone get a 2 star. So a lot of people, myself included, would roll the dice on level 7 and prage for Mortdog's good graces, and this is what was known as the Dragon Lottery. That being said though, dragons were sick. Each one had their own playstyle and comp you could play around while having some game-breaking interactions. First one that comes to mind is Shioyu. No, the first one comes to mind as Siphon, but we're going to get to that in a minute. Shioyu, or commonly referred to as Shrek, was a big part of the two melee ACOS dragons, with those two being auto clicks in stage 3 and 4 to try and win the game. Jade was a cool trait to play around, uh, pretty much it was like a set 10's disco, giving a small heal and attack speed buff. The only problem with it is it wasn't like whispers where you could cap out with pike, you kind of had to rely on other carries to try and hit your verticals, as your only high cost units were Shioyu, Nico and Soraka, but more about Soraka later. That's not to say that Jade was bad, not by any means, it was definitely had his moment in the sun, and was consistently strong throughout his run, but it lacked a consistent carry, unless you managed to 3 star Anivia, so his strength was just basically off the back of Shioyu being absolutely filthy. Deja was the ACOS range fantasy of set 7, and with the Mirage trade giving special bonuses game to game, it was kind of like you picked at some games and then you went 8 the other games, um, depending on which one there was. Or if you managed to get a certain emblem, you elevated it to untold heights. There was a certain charm to Deja, and in the right hands, you could be extremely strong. 
It was a shame that those hands were never mine. Now, Siphon was my set seven love. I already told you that I climbed a challenger abusing Siphon. There were many ways to play Whispers, as it was kind of simplistic. Being a scaling trait with a bit of resistance shred, and it kind of had a perfect trait web between Silas, Pike, and Elise. You had insane options from vertical re-rolling Elise, but Elise will get her own segment shortly. But Siphon, like she you, kind of leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouth because she could slide and glide into the back line and one tap most carries. And with the right positioning, there was literally nothing you could do. Then there was Idas, the last of the melee cost dragons, and was the only true tank dragon. But with him also came one of the sickest gold generation traits in TFT history, Shimmer Scale. Now the trait itself was vaguely terrible in terms of units, as the only kind of carry unit was Zoe, but even then she wasn't a real carry and you had to play around other units. What made Shimmer Scale so cool was they introduced us to gold generation items. Some of them we still have in the game to this day, and others have slowly been removed. And then there's the prismatic piece, Crown of Champions, which everyone has now experienced in Mengu's party. These items were all very distinct in their own way, and because it was the, the time when TFT was kind of unbalanced, they they were absolutely disgusting. Gold Mancer's Draven Axe and Gambler's Blade scaled to 80 gold. That means if you're a psychopathic enough to get enough gold, you could have 100 AP, 100 AD, or 100 attack speed from these items alone, which is pretty good. You know, and then there was also one of the most adjusted items in TFT history, and that was Mobile Mail. Back then, it gave 300 flat HP, 8 HP, 1 MR, and 1 armor per stack. And that each stacked 40 times, meaning at full stacks you could literally have 600 health, 80 armor, 80 MR, all on your 1 star, 1100 health tank that also had built in damage reduction. So you almost always got all the stacks and all the gold, and Idus would pretty much refuse to die in any case. And then there was one shimmer scale item that got phased out pretty quick, Philosopher's Stone. And if you haven't heard of this item before, it had one of the craziest PBE runs of all time. In fact, Set 7 had so many bugs that a huge chunk of its already insanely long patch notes were dedicated just to bug fixes, with almost 20 bug fixes per patch. To give you an understanding, here's all of the bug fixes for Set 11. And Philosopher's Stone basically meant that you could just press reroll and 3 star a unit. Nothing wrong with that one more, why don't you bring it back? And then we had the 10 gold dragons, and oh boy, they were not created equally. Alshin was unequivocally the strongest 10 cost dragon, and if you don't agree with me, then fight me in the comments, because this is a hill I'll absolutely die on. Not only did he come with Tempest, which is also the most flexible trait of any dragon, which gave you a 1 second stun with true damage, and while that was happening, you could watch him sprinkle his white goodness all over your enemies, but oh my god. He also came with a mana drain, so he could literally deny any other champion from casting. Tempest Aoshin was consistently, for the entire run, the strongest comp in the game. Being able to use Orn, the Splash Bruiser, the most flexible frontline trait, you could almost get any backline or frontline carry, not to mention that you typically run Nomzi as well. It was just an insane comp. All in. And then there was Shivana. <laughs> ooh, ooh, Shivana was uh, pretty bad. I'm not gonna lie, Shivana was terrible, or well, at least for most of the set. There was a point where she would sometimes fly up and ult one unit, but then they fixed her a bit, and then she actually became vaguely useful. But even then, you never really felt excited about picking her up. You'd always want to save yourself for Elshin or Aurelian Soul. And then there was Aurelian Soul. And while Elshin might have been the strongest tank cost for the duration of the set, Aurelian Soul had one patch where he was elevated to such insane heights by a spatula item that he literally just took over the meta. If you had a mage spatula and a one star Aurelian Soul, you could easily top for, if not win the game. The attack damage debuff basically made certain comps useless, and the multiple cast with the damage amp could just overwhelm them with damage before they had even a chance to react. At Riot did attempt to fix this. They removed the attack damage debuffs, and they made it so more cast after a certain point actually did more damage. Did it work? No, not really. Mage Spat was still absolutely disgusting on him, only this time you died even faster. 
Now, while the dragons might have been the biggest part of the set, they weren't by any means the only part of the set. Set 7 also featured some truly mind-blowing abilities and units that, to this day, the Riot are probably extremely cautious about implementing again. The one that probably springs to mind the most is Soraka. Now, Soraka by herself was fine, you know, she was a... Uh, Average five cost. No, no, actually no. She was pretty. She was pretty terrible. She was basically just set three Soraka, um, but with her trait, she became pretty good. So she did help make Jade feel a bit stronger. It was her trait Star Caller that was truly insane. If you had a 100 health, she would just straight one shot a random enemy. If you didn't, you gained a little HP, but if you 3 star her, she'd almost heal you to full, meaning that there were occasions where the game went beyond its normal limits, and I mean well beyond its normal limits. And now that's the reason why after stage 7, even if you lose by one unit, it's, it's a one hit kill. Then there was Zoe and her spell thief trade, where she cycled through different abilities which were Daisy, the Janus Tornado from set 3.5, Chaos of Vulnerability and Lux's Final Spark, each one having different strengths and weaknesses, but it was always kind of exciting to play her, especially as she filled out the Shema Scale comp, and, but there were times when you would roll the wrong thing over and over again and you got very, very frustrated. And then there was Yasuo, which felt very similar to his set 1 iteration, just with cooler effects and a nicer skin. Being able to one-shot a champion in a 1v1 really came in handy against certain gongs and dragons. So what about the trades? Now set 7 did have some very cool trades. Now Astral was the reroll trait of the set. Every few shops you would have a significantly higher chance of seeing an Astral unit. So you can quickly hit your 3 star units and still have enough tempo to snowball to a cat board with Aurelian Soul. Between Nami and Vlad you almost had options to play around and Skana 3 was not bad at all. It was surprisingly strong. Nidalee was just her set 1 form but it was the first patch where Astral was really strong. There was once a point when Astral Emblem existed, and you could play 6 Astral and slap that bad boy on a 5 cost and 3 star it in one turn. Needless to say, that was patched out real fast. Now Guild was one of Riot's first attempts at a trait that affected other units, and from all metrics, it was definitely a success. The units themselves were fine, and they had their uses, and being able to give a stat to your entire team is pretty f***ing good. Talon was definitely a unit you could play around, especially with Diana and Pike, and there were times when Assassin was incredibly strong in the meta, but it often skewed the power of certain units like Sejuani, who with Hecarim Nunu, gave you an extremely reliable frontline and extra stats for practically no money investment. There was also a Rise reroll build that was more built around mage because you got so much value, but Guild had one unit that was awesome, and that was Bard. Bard was amazing. His ability to give you a higher percentage shops means that there were some wonky things you could do or high roll into. Like when you get curse packed in 2 1, and then you find a Bard in the next shop and go into a full legendaries. Plus, his ability was an AoE stun with damage amp. So not only did you get more mana per auto from playing him, you also got more legendaries, more CC, more damage, and more MR if you wanted to splash Mystic, which you almost always did. The unit was literally overtuned to the max. And probably I should have included in my most broken units of all time video. Whoopsies. Revel had its moments. Cannoneer Corky was an extremely popular comp with Revel Splash and throw in an Nidus for frontline with a little bit of Nomsy action, get a Mage Spam, put it on zone, and you're laughing. But if you're feeling extra spicy and you've got the right augment, you could offer a slightly weaker frontline and play Revel Deja which is probably, to this day, one of the most filthy interactions in TFT history. His auto attacks were counted as abilities, so he would proc Revel every single time he autoed. Whilst there was Trainer. Trainer was a beautiful trait. It fit into almost every comp with a Lulu giving Evoker and Heimer giving CC. It kind of splashed with Mage into almost any comp imaginable, and with Nomsy infinitely scaling, you could get to a point where Nomsy's HP damage could win you the game just as much as a Corky, a Deja, or even a Siphon. But there was one trait that was pretty mediocre for most of the run of the set, and that was Rage Wing. And I mean, conceptually and thematically, it's awesome. The idea of not generating mana was an intriguing idea. I mean, aside from a few instances here and there, it was always overshadowed by Shrek and Siphon. And for one, again, Shivana was almost a complete griefer of a unit. But there was one unit that had its moment. 
and that was Swain. That wasn't because of Rage Blade, that was because of Dragon Monster. And with an item like Rage Blade and a couple of Jade units like Nara and Nico for Shapeshifter, you would get a million health, a million damage, and also the Dragon Monster buff, and you would absolutely just take over the game. Wayne just had a moment where everyone was playing it for about a week or two, until it again got left into the ground like all the comms did. But Dragon Monster was really the trait they kept on giving, giving rise to some of the sickest reroll comms in the set. There's one punch Lee Sin, where if you build infinite AP items, you could punch people into the next century, or Volibear, who went from the worst unit in the set to a literal god in one patch, causing Mort to get a little upset at the community. So, uh, I am really, really angry at the community and how they responded to Volibear. Um, I think Volibear was already close to balanced before this patch, uh, but people hadn't figured out how to play him. And the other thing is that, like, Legend is a hard comp to play. People hadn't figured out how to play him. Um, and other things are just a little out of line, like Corky and Zaya. But these buffs made sense to me. And I'm going to tell you now, I was the one who put these buffs in. So if you want to, you know, take that and you say I'm bad at my job, you go right ahead. But a lot of people were really down my throat. Now what happened is, Bebe had like one game where a Volibear did really, really well. He was strong because you had the Legend Bonus and Dragon Master to turn him into a 1v9 god. And of course, you could always camp out with Yasuo. But it wasn't until 7.5 where Dragon Master really took on an, a whole new meaning. And then there was the conditional trait of Scale Scorn. Oh god, another conditional trait, really? I mean, Scale Scorn was fine. I mean, there were, there were definitely some cool reroll Scale Scorn comps with Olaf and Diana. And you, if you got an Assassin's Bat with an RFC, Olaf just basically ran around killing everyone. But it wasn't something that you played for, unless you got the Augment. It was just something that you got when the conditions were met, which is, I guess it's an intended use case, but my god, why? And I already mentioned Jade with Shrek, but Jade was our first ever 12 unit trait. Meaning that if you're very lucky, you can get to 12 Jades, and it was by far one of the strongest Pyrismatic TFT has ever had. Considering that you required infinite spatulas, hearts, and a tactician's crown, it was almost never really a game plan, it was just more something you stumbled into. And of course there's Whispers, like truly, I love this trait. It had some of the most amazing comps we'd ever seen, between Silas shredding mana and Thresh being an amazing utility unit that was kind of like a soft attempt at a Blitzcrank, just less frustrating. You kind of had it all. You could play vertically and you could play with other traits and you could cap out with Pike if you're playing Assassins or even if you're playing Elise. Now, people were telling me in my previous video that Elise, 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 I know how good Elise was, I just didn't include it because, you know, she required items and stuff, but Elise was truly a crazy unit and at least for set seven probably the most frustrating one to play against because her ability to jump up after she'd cast how did this get through play tests and whoever allowed this to go through should either be fired or promoted because it was so questionably fun and i already mentioned mirage and it was similar to set six mutant and it had some games where it was Everyone trying to play it, and there were some games when no one would. There were a few reroll comps kicking around involving Yone and maybe a Nunu, but it wasn't until 7.5 when Nunu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all know Nunu. And speaking of Nunu, actually, the Cavalier Smash that was one of the best items in the game. Being able to turn a dragon or a champion into probably one of the best frontline traits of the set was kind of not balanced. A Cavalier Yasuo, Cavalier Shioyu, basically anything Cavalier, and you just couldn't kill it. Actually, that was one thing that Set 7 had. It had amazing special interactions, and every time you saw one in your augments, you went through a million ideas in your head of what you could possibly achieve. Dragon Monster being the top of the list, and then Mage being a very close second. It was one of the most exploratory sets in post-augment TFT, and one of the few sets in recent years where it felt like every time I played it, I was excited to see what I could do. There was so much charm in this set. One man's treasure is another man's trash. And a lot of people did not like this set, which is fine. But speaking of Mage Spout, 
You toss one of those bad boys on a Sona or a Yasuo, and <laughs> you're, or really any unit in the set, you're, you're having a good time. The set mechanic wasn't just dragons. The set mechanic was also an armory. It replaced the dragon on stage four. Now, whether you think the armory was a good idea or not is up for debate, but for me, it was a pretty good idea. Not great. Being able to kind of force some items was a nice touch, although I've never really understood why you put a reroll on your gold. That to me was a bit weird. Now, the real issue is that it was at different points that all of these things were strong. One week it was Dragon Monster, the next week it was Dragons. It was never all at the same time. Balance thrashing is a term that we hear from your typical armchair TFT balance enthusiast. And set seven was the epitome of that, where each patch was a, a wild swing to see where things would go and if they could get it into any semblance of a balanced state. A lot of the patches were legitimate PhD dissertation levels of text, and for the entirety of its run, it didn't seem like it, there was, it was going to be possible. And my best guess is that this is the first set that featured augments as the evergreen feature, and the set wasn't designed with that in mind originally. Each set is designed and started its implementation with one year of its release, and augments were so new that for one, they didn't know how to balance them, for two, Augments have a tendency to exponentially increase the strengths of comps in certain conditions. So when all of the units are insanely strong and you make them stronger with augments, it's, it becomes pretty challenging to balance around. And if there's any wrong augments or any wrong interactions in the roster, these insanely strong units become completely overbearing and game warping. And before I go, I recently created a member space, so if you want to sign up and support my content more than just a like and a comment, feel free to sign up. I'll be adding more rewards later, but for now, you can sign up for a dollar or two. Get your name towards the beginning of the video saying, Microphone Donator. More tiers might be announced depending on what or if you guys want. Let me know. But for me, I don't think Set 7 was one of the best sets we've ever had, but I think it was fun. It was definitely fun. Every unit had some kind of insane fantasy or something to chase. Was it balanced? No. But it was fun.